everybody. Thanks for joining us here. It's another class day at Sunnyside. Today is roadie day. Roadies and azaleas, our state flower, one of my favorites. So say hi to Nicole back there. Good morning. Her background, I don't know, mine might be just as pretty as hers today. I brought some plants in finally. Mr. Smith is also in the house, the whistling gardener. He'll keep him, keep him on his toes on the chat line, please. I am uh, Trevor, our general manager here, and welcome to Roadie Class 2022. It's kind of a fun day here at Sunnyside. The sun is out. It is beautiful. Spring has sprung. We got some special guests coming down today, the Roadie Society. We'll have a trust show down here. If you're in the neighborhood, swing down. They'll knock your socks off with some fabulous flowers. We got plants everywhere. It's just a perfect spring day. So we'll get going on class. Like usual, the handout is way too long. You know, nighttime nightstand reading there gets you at least an hour or so on six pages. So hopefully you got access to the handout. It's on the website if you need it still. Um, speaking of the website, you know, Nicole and I spent some time over the winter months. Uh, we always update the rhododendron pages. You can look at flowers. We got a list on there that'll kind of kind of set you how many we carry. I think we're at uh, 130, 40, something like that. You know, there's 5,000 hybrid rhododendrons out there. Uh, if you can you can find them, there's some that you'll hardly ever find. I'm still looking for a couple for 30 years that I haven't seen yet. But uh, there's lots of choices out there, and we do carry a, I think I think an excellent selection for a nursery. So. Uh, and the azaleas, they're little Easter egg colors blooming everywhere right now. So with the cold spring, you know, usually we kind of stretch out bloom here for a little longer. In the next two, three weeks, pretty much everything is going to be blooming because we finally got some sunshine and we're warming up. Uh, so a lot of them are going to pop into flower here. It's a great time to come down and look. Uh, you can see, see all your options, okay? Um, you know, Easy thing to start with, we'll run a big slideshow here and I got lots of pictures and way too much information as usual, but uh, easy thing to start with is, you know, Rhodia azalea. Yes, I think most every yard up here has one. Yes, you should have them in your yard. There's nothing wrong with it because you have Rhodias and azaleas. Um, it's the perfect spring blooming shrub. You know, it, it loves our acidic soil. You know, you could call it native, you know, to the Pacific Northwest because many of them are. Um, but it's, it's a great plant to utilize. I mean, evergreen, we'll do some deciduous azaleas too, but mainly evergreen plants, spectacular spring flower, and something that you would have foliage on all through the season. Um, you know, one real quick thing I thought I'd mention that I don't usually put in the slideshow um, is maybe some hardiness. You know, we got a little chilly this winter. Um, a lot of the things in my yard I know got fried back a bit, as well as most of the gardeners we've been talking to here the last month. We get lots of cool pictures like, will this come back? Hard to say, you know, we prune things back and keep our fingers crossed, uh, but it's no different with Rhodi. You know, when we look at rhododendrons, they're typically classified as either H1, H2, H3, H4. We can go on and on. You know, rhododendrons grow in the tropics. There's plenty that grow in the Amazon rainforest. There's other ones that will grow in much colder climates. So look at your hardiness. H1 will get me down there, you know, in the 20, 25 below zero for most customers. Super hardy for Folks that live up north, you know, maybe get a little bit, little bit colder than we do. And we start scaling up from there. You know, some of the coolest flowers, a lot of the oranges and blends and, 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 and fun ones to me are a lot of H3s, you know, and we're down there at that, you know, kind of zero to 10 degree range. So yes, this winter, um, you know, a couple of mine that I had, plants aren't dead. I don't, you know, I don't, not, I'm not gonna throw them in the compost, but we lose some flower buds and they don't look perfect coming out of winter. Put some food on them. They flush out, off we go for another season. You know, it's not something you would lose, but sometimes those H3 and definitely H4 uh, belongs more down by San Francisco. That's the stuff that can barely take uh, much frost at all. So so watch your hardiness is the point. Um, you know, like I mentioned, you know, the American Rhododendron Society is a great nonprofit that kind of catalogs and analyzes and keeps all these uh, 5,000 plus uh, cultivars somewhat straight. We've had great breeders uh, right here locally, you know, going back for a hundred years, you know, in, in our in our little climate that have introduced a lot of great plants to the trade. Some of them you can still find, others are a little harder to come by. Uh, but the point is, you know, we're in rhododendron country. So the Rhododendron Society is a great resource, you know, to look up information if you need. Um, you know, their local chapter, the Pilchuck chapter, the folks that will be down here today, We've got some great plants they bring down to sell here for the nursery or helping out the nonprofit um, here by buying those as well. But some, you know, I, I, we'll put it this way. 
I've already purchased seven of them in the last week since they came in. So that should tell you there's some pretty, pretty fun plants in there to try. All right. So we'll start on the slideshow, but the last thing I would say is this. You know, I think rhododendrons sometimes are a little bit misunderstood. You know, we don't have to have, you know, a gigantic 12 foot bury, bury the side of my garage rhododendron like my grandmother had or even my parents. You know, there's a lot of modern hybrids that, again, really nice flowers, but different growth habits. You know, it's really hard as a gardener because I'm no different than you folks. You come into Sunnyside, you look at all the choices, you're like, wow, that flower is spectacular. You don't look at, does it like sun? Does it like shade? How big will it get? You know, and I think, not, 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 not to point the finger at anybody, but the rhododendron haters out there, I think, don't like them because they put the wrong rhododendron in the wrong spot. So we either have one in, that belongs in shade and they put it in sun and it gets burnt every year. Or we go the opposite and we end up with a leggy, stretchy, you know, kind of not the prettiest plant. Um, if we if we took us on one in shade, so you know, ask us. We got great staff here. You know, look some of these up. There's lots of options where you can get again the right plant for the right place. No different with uh, with the rhododendrons and azaleas as well. So let me start the slideshow here. So there's our slideshow. There's me. So just a couple, you know, kind of quick points. We'll look at a whole bunch of pictures here. You know, rhododendrons, you know, all these are perfect spring blooming shrubs. I mean, these are the creatures that we start blooming late February, March. Some rhododendrons are one of June. I've got a big old one I inherited in my front yard, you know, that flowers late May and through June, which is really nice, kind of more towards early summer. You know, all the plants we're going to talk about today bloom on old wood. So if you ever attend my pruning classes, you probably are, have beat it into your head by now. Prune after bloom is always a great rule. This is the perfect thing for rhodes and azaleas. If we're gonna prune these back, we're gonna let them flower here this spring, then do our pruning, reflush the growth, set flower buds, and then we'll see you again next year kind of thing. If I go out and prune these in mid late summer, and certainly not the fall before winter, but if I go out too late, I'm gonna cut off all my flowers and I don't have a chance for that plant to regrow, harden off and set flower buds for 2023. So pruning after bloom is ideal. Um, Rhodes are pretty easy. You can chop them back a third if you want. You can deadhead them if you're OCD like me. You can kind of do what you like, but they certainly can be maintained. I think a huge thing that would help people is, is pruning their azaleas. You know, don't spend two hours with the hand pruners cutting every single little branch. You know, get some head, head shears out and just round them off after they flower. You can cut down into some of that bare wood and you're gonna have a tighter, denser plant that is gonna be covered in flowers every year. You look, you know, maybe you watch the Masters golf tournament like I do, or you see things in magazines and you see, you know, Arboretum or, or, or good quality azaleas that have been grown for years. You know, you can't see the flat, you can't see the foliage when they're in bloom. And that's how mine are right now in my yard because again, they get lightly sheared um, after they after they bloom each spring. Um, always use a good organic roadie food on all the things we're talking about today. You know, we'll have this on special for the class. We'll talk about that later, but EB Stone Organics, whether it's a four pound bag or you, you got a bunch of roadies like me and you buy a 15 pound bag, it's a great time of year to fertilize these coming out of winter. And then perhaps one more time, you know, in that early mid June time frame, that will get me a nice set of growth and a really nice bud set going out for the next season. You know, one thing at the bottom there, I kind of added last year, you know, we have a lot of folks call and say, maybe my plant's struggling with flower. I'm not getting as much bloom as I would like. You know, there's a lot of reasons that could be, but a great place to start is the fertilizer. The better we take care of, of rhododendrons and azaleas over the summer, not let them get drought stressed, make sure they're fed properly. We get rewarded with the flower show the next spring uh, by doing those things. Ultra Bloom is one I added on there, and I've had a lot of customers with good feedback that say, yeah, you know what, I used roti food and I put a little dose of Ultra Bloom on there in early summer. That will encourage a little bit more budding for the next season because it has more phosphorus, more potassium in it. So keep in mind both those. I think they're great, great, you know, both great fertilizers, but maybe if yours hasn't been blooming quite as much to your liking, a really nice addition of that Ultra Bloom might help. You know, container growing plants, you know, I, I won't lie to you, you can grow any plant in a pot. You know, that's an easy way to look at it. 
Um, but this rhodes and azaleas are very shallow rooted and want to spread a little bit um, as far as root systems. So it's not an ideal plant, you know, long term for a container. It certainly can be done, but you would almost want to get something very wide and not quite as deep as far as choosing your planter. Um, you know, container grown plants here at the nursery is about half our, half our inventory. So we get some growers that grow them in a container, propagate them, keep them light. They're more in a potting soil, you know, barky, acidic type mix that you can take home very easily and plant. We get other things, field grown that are, that are field dug out of the ground and then slipped into a larger pot. So maybe you get an older plant, something that's a little more developed. Um, rhododendrons are always graded on width. So the more, the more width it is, the older it is, uh, the little bit be a little bit more expensive. So uh, we get a massive amount of field grown plants because most folks are in, like me, a little more instant gratification. I don't want to watch it grow for five years. I'd rather have something, you know, at least a couple of feet by a couple of feet to start with to put in my yard so I can see it right away and then watch it develop from there. Um, you know, when you're planting them, um, you know, make sure you dig again, just like we talked about with the container situation, you know, a wider hole, make sure we don't have hard pan clay down there. We want good drainage. We don't want to be too wet, but we want to make sure that plant's got some nice, good soil to spread out. We amend it with some acid planting mix, which you'll see on the slides here in a minute. That's a compost that's got extra sulfur in it. So it's perfect for blueberries, azaleas, camellias, roadies, all the things we're talking about today as an amendment, or I can use it as a potting soil. If I was going to plant a little roadie in a container for a couple of years to enjoy before I put it in my yard, I wouldn't buy a regular potting soil. I would buy that acidic mixture that we carry from EB Stone. Uh, that's a great way to go. Um, and rhododendrons love mulch. You know, we can't mulch up the trunks. We don't want to bury the stems, especially on azaleas. Be real careful. But we don't, we, you know, we can add mulch around those plants every single season. When I feed mine, I'll typically add a nice dose of roadie food and then immediately go with some compost. If you like bark, that's fine too. Um, but that will help keep them moist as we dry out into the summer. Because again, like we talked about earlier, the better care I take care of over the summer, I'm going to have a happier plant come that next spring. If a, if a roadie or azalea gets drought stressed at all, you know, in June, July, August, early September, the first thing it's going to do to say no flower buds for you. You'll get nothing for next year. I'm gonna to try to hold on to my leaves and survive through this dry period. So mulching them will help. You don't have to go out water a roadie every day in your yard. It's, that's not what this is about, but you know, maybe it's a once a week or once every couple weeks on an established landscape, just to keep them slightly moist and, and keep them happy through the drier summer months, okay? Now here's some of those products real quick. We have all these at the store. Um, sure Start's a great transplant fertilizer. You, I'm glad we would never be upset if you use that when you plant your rhododendrons. If you have roadie food, just go ahead and use that. It's got the same mycorrhizae, but a little little more specific food for the roadie. You can see on the on the picture there, roadie, azalea, azalea, blueberry. It's a great fertilizer for all of our acidic things in our little Pacific Northwest gardens. Ultra Bloom. You know, again, I want more flower. That's what's going to help me get a little more bud. I use that on dahlias, containers, all kinds of other stuff. Uh, but it's a great one for roadies if you want to get a little more flower uh, come that next spring. And then there's a great picture of that, they, you know, acid camellia mix. Um, it's azalea, roadie, blueberry, again, anything acidic. And that's one of those hybrid soils. So I could use that in lieu of compost again, to have happy plants when I put them in, or I can use that as a straight potting soil. That's one of those kind of hybrid products we can use either way. Um, now, if we get into roadies here uh, for a few minutes, we're gonna do kind of roadies, evergreen azaleas and deciduous azaleas, but just to kind of give you a, a crash course on all three, um, you know, kind of a couple funny puns here, but you know, foliage size matters on rhododendron. Um, and color matters to me as well. When you, when you look at sun versus shade, you know, everybody's seen roadies with this big a leaf and we've got ones with gigantic foliage. Typically as a general rule, the bigger the leaf, the more shade it's gonna like. You know, all rhododendrons are gonna do fine in half and half, morning sun, afternoon shade. We can grow any single roadie azalea on the property in that. When we get to the afternoon heat, or no sun at all, then we have to be a little bit more careful on which one we choose. So we get an attractive plant, 
that's going to be happy in that new spot in our yard. So, so look at the foliage size is one key. Smaller leafed ones will take a little bit more heat usually. Um, larger ones, more shade. And then also color. You know, a lot of people have come in the last few weeks and said, I've got full sun. What, what should I be looking for? You know, the majority of the reds, purples, and a number of pinks are going to be okay with afternoon sun. More of the yellows, oranges, whites, peaches, kind of all those colors generally are a little bit better for morning sun only and afternoon shade. So that may be a, a kind of a, a little place to start. You know, look at your bloom times. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, we can have roadies in February. We can have them all the way to June. Um, you know, look at some sc scattering your bloom. Everything doesn't have to flower at one big display in the yard. Um, you know, we had a, had a really good customer yesterday, took home 20 rhododendrons and she was very smart and said, look, I'd like to have these three colors but I want to look out on my green belt and see rhododendrons flowering in March, April, May, and, and perhaps even into early June. So we made a nice selection so that that's what would happen. You know, look at dwarf rhododendrons. There's a lot of dwarf options out there um, for or against some tolerant places and some shade. A lot of people look at them and think they're little azaleas, but they're actually little dwarf rhodes. And typically a dwarf rhododendron will be a little bit more resilient sometimes than an azalea in certain parts of the yard. So look at a lot of the dwarf ones. Sorry, I skipped the, the prune back one third height and spread, the one above that. Um, you know, that's just a general pruning tip. You know, if I'm gonna cut back my rhodia or azalea after bloom again, enjoy the flowers first, I can usually safely go a third in height or a third in spread and be just fine. Um, you know, one big thing with me is I, I love foliage. You know, the flowers, they come and go. They look great here for, four or six weeks when they're in bloom, then I'm left with my roadie the rest of the year with its green leaves. Um, look for something you like the foliage of. There's a huge variety of different rhododendrons. We'll see some pictures here as well. But, you know, pick something that catches your eye. You know, is it variegated? Does it have injumentum? Um, there's a lot of cool traits on roadie foliage that maybe some gardeners would enjoy having in their yard, you know, the other 10 months when it's not in flower. Um, you know, I still think there's there's places for old school, old classics, old standbys, whatever you want to call them. You know, there's still spots in the garden for some of those good old fashioned ones that do maybe get large or are an old school flower. Um, they certainly will thrive as well, but there's a lot of really cool new ones too that have come out uh, more recently that would be a little more compact and maybe some different colors. You know, I look for an intricate flower. You know, is it one that's got spotting on the lobe? Is it one that has two-tone color? maybe a Piketty edge. Um, there's some pretty sweet flowers when you start looking at them as they bloom. Uh, certainly plenty of options for you. And then like we mentioned earlier, look at your hardiness zone. Uh, be real careful what you choose. You know, zone three, you know, H, well, H3, H2, H1 are typically all okay up here. Uh, maybe if I'm up in the hills a little more, uh, I'm gonna avoid the H3 down by the water, certainly fine, but maybe up in the hills, a little more prone to maybe losing some buds with uh, with the cold winter. Now, here's just a couple foliage choices. Um, you know, on the right there, you can see variegation. You know, that's one called Gold Flimmer. We would have President Roosevelt. We've got Ponticum, which is a great kind of white green variegated. Um, there's not a lot of choices for variegated roadies, but, you know, they are cool. You know, it's something when it's not in bloom, like that picture right there, you know, I've got an attractive foliage I can use in my landscape and get the bonus of a flower every spring as well. Um, I really like Injumentum on the other side there. Um, this looks, someone would probably look at that and think, well, what's wrong with that roadie? It has powdery mildew. No, it doesn't. I mean, if you touch that leaf there, it's almost soft like velvet. It's kind of one of the scratch and sniff plants. You, you kind of got to feel it to believe it. It's very soft. Um, Injumentum on, is covering all of the new leaves on a, on a lot of what we call Yakushimatum or Yak rhododendrons from Japan. Lots of options for silvers and whites and cinnamon colors. Um, again, adds a really cool foliage interest um, to a lot of the roadies. It eventually will rub off the top, but you could walk up, you know, if you're down here today, we'll show you, you know, you could walk up and touch a good Yakusha Manum rhododendron and it feels like velvet. You touch underneath the leaf and it's always soft. On the top, it does rub off eventually, but, uh, but they are fun and have a nice flower too. You know, sometimes in the winter, you know, we get good foliage color. A lot of the PJMs will turn mahogany or bronzy. 
uh, color over the winter. Just again, to add a little more interest in the landscape, still nice spring flower, but I've added that extra season of interest with the winter. And a lot of them have new growth color. You know, that's one called uh, Oxbow's Red Elizabeth right there. That's got green base color, a nice red flower, but right now it's got the pure burgundy uh, foliage coming up as it's done blooming. So again, more interest for the landscape instead of just a green roadie with the red flower, we've got it. We've got a little more something special there with the foliage. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, if we look at some white, again, white would be one that I would try to locate a little bit more in morning sun, afternoon shade. Certainly there's a couple of exceptions, but as a good rule, that, that's one to think of. Um, you know, there's some great white ones. Kind of white's making a comeback around here. I, I don't have a lot of white left. Everybody wants white again this year, uh, where typically we sell a lot more yellow and orange and purple. But uh, we do have some still. Uh, Snow Lady is a very early bloomer <coughs> with the nice foliage on it, too. If you can see through the flowers there, it's kind of, kind of nice round, a little bit different foliage interest. Then we have old school one like Shinoides. That's got a nice yellow flare. That would be a big old bushy wide one. That's a great one if you want to eat up some space kind of left and right, maybe not get quite as tall, but a, but certainly a nice big bushy one. Kind of like the Cunningham's white would be the same way. Oh, right there you can see in the landscape, you know, nice big wide bushy one. <laughs> I'm getting going. And then Picabello, you can see, is one with a white spot uh, or a purple spot on a white flower. And that's one we get very striking when it's in bloom. We've got some other ones around like Calsap and a couple others that look similar to that as well. Uh, one second here. I'm sorry. Something was going on with my computer, Nicole. Um, so we got some orangey options here. Uh, sea View Sunset is one. We have a few plants around. Uh, neon, we don't have yet. We were supposed to get some yesterday, but we'll have some of those here pretty quick. Again, some of these are going to be the ones that are a little bit more frost prone. I have Sea View Sunset in my own yard in Everett. have no problems. It's in bloom right now. It looks great. Uh, neon is one. I might have expected a little bit of bud loss this winter. <laughs> if we look at some yellows, you know, Hotai is a great old fashioned canary yellow. Uh, that's a perfect one if you just want pure yellow. We don't need any other spotting or colors or tones. I just want something that glows yellow. That's a great uh, old-fashioned specimen type rhododendron. <coughs> Excuse me. On the newer side here um, is Horizon Monarch, and that is one out of the Thompson's nurseries down on the Oregon coast. They've got a whole series of those out. But Horizon Monarch is a fabulous flower. That's a big, huge bloom. Big, huge leaf um, and a really nice size grower as well. Uh, Nancy Evans is probably one of our best selling rhododendrons, period. It, it looks a little orangey red in bud. And then when it opens, it's got a nice yellow flower. <coughs> that one's not super tall. You know, maybe we wanted something more like four foot-ish tall and wide. Uh, Nancy Evans would be a great choice for that. We've got some fabulous plants down. Um, and then Lemon Dream is another kind of newer, compact one. Great yellow, all yellow flower, um, nice attractive foliage and a little bit lower, a little bit bushier uh, than some of the other pure yellows. Now, if we look at a few pinks, uh, we've got something like Cherry Cheesecake. You know, that to me is the poster child for one of the modern rhododendrons. I mean, look at that flower, that is spectacular with the blotch, it's got the Picotty edge on it, whiter center. You know, that's a beautiful pink flower. If you like pinks, we've got a few cherry cheesecakes here. And then something old school like Cosmopolitan. <coughs> that's one I always try to find that we stock here at the nursery. An easy one to grow, very hardy, um, and a really nice pink, again, with that dark blotch on the back. That's, a, that's an attractive one as well. Uh, Anna Rose Whitney's the, one of the big dogs. So that's one of those old school ones. Uh, with a huge orchid pink flower. We go through quite a bit of Anna Rose Whitney for folks that want, <coughs> you know, excuse me, a large six, seven, eight foot pink rhododendron as it gets old. Uh, one that can take a little bit of shade, you know, and honestly end up as a tall shrub slash small tree as it matures. That's a great specimen plant uh, with the big flower on it too. 
And then there's another kind of modern one, Melrose Flash. You know, that almost looks like an Asiatic lily to me. If you look at that flower, you know, it's got a little different color, but that could be stargazer lily or, or a different plant. That is a really pretty flower. We've got a few uh, Melrose Flash around. Finally, a couple reds. You know, Taurus is the early blooming red. These have already finished. If you drove around, you know, later March and early April and saw a massive leaf with a huge red flower, that typically is Taurus. Now that we get into the April, May time frame, we start to see the Jean Marie's, the Trilby's, a bunch of other good reds out as well. You know, but probably Jean Marie, you know, if we wanted to spell it out, it's the, the Honorable Jean, Jean Marie de Montague is the long name. We just like to call her Jean or Jean Marie. Um, you know, that's a great fire engine red. And that is probably one of the most common planted roadies up here. But I think also is one of the easiest ones to grow. I mean, that one's going to take sun, probably a little dry, a little bit better. It's a really easy one to grow, attractive foliage. Uh, certainly to me, one we get a little bit more of for gardeners because I think that's a really easy red if you're looking for something maybe, you know, five feet by five feet. A Vulcan would be a little darker, kind of an orangey red, you know, a little more of a spreading habit. And then Elizabeth, you saw earlier, we looked at Otzbo's Elizabeth with the burgundy foliage. A regular red Elizabeth would be all green, but we've got that kind of companulate or bell flower on that one. It's not going to be the huge truss, but more of those kind of lax flowers that, that hang a little bit, which are, which are fun. Then we've got some purple. You know, Polar Knot uh, is a newer one, uh, super hardy, you know, probably the hardiest of the purples we carry for temperature. It's got a great dark flower and again, and again, a nice, bushy, attractive habit. It's not going to be leggy like some of the old purples around, um, but I think a really attractive, good sun tolerant type purple to try. We, we get lots of those in. Uh, Blue Peter is kind of one of those old school. This one would prefer morning sun. I wouldn't do afternoon sun on Blue Peter. That's a really pretty flower if you like the lavender purple with that really pretty blotch. Um, you know, and probably one that sprawls a little bit. That's not going to be a super tight, compact one, but probably one of the prettiest flowers in the in the blue-purple range. You know, old school purple is still purple splendor. You know, that's probably still the darkest one you'll find, um, per dark purple with the black blotch. But again, it's a little bit more of a leggy plant. You know, if this gets pruned, I think it would be more of an attractive landscape shrub. If you let that one go, it's gonna be a little more, more open and airy, which is great for some spots in the yard, but certainly can be pruned to keep it a little more uh, compact. And then last there is a, is a blue, blue baron. So this one just finished. I have, that's one from my yard. Um, that's a great small leafed one that would take sun, not get super big. And that's about as close to you know, kind of indigo blue as I've seen on a rhododendron. That's a really popular one here. I think we have just a couple small plants left now that they've been in flower, um, but certainly one to, to put on the wish list if you like that color tone. Now, just a couple things with roadies. <clears throat> you know, we, we could we could make this probably a week class and we could just do roadies, but um, just a couple things that we see or I see a lot of folks email about and bring samples down. You know, maybe some things to watch for in the yard if you're growing rhododendrons. Number one in my 30 years of doing this is root weevil. I don't know that anybody around our neck of the woods <clears throat> doesn't have root weevil damage on something in their yard. Rhody, laurel, anything that's a big evergreen foliage. You're always going to see those bite marks at the edge of the leaf, not in the center. It looks like somebody crawled up and took a little snatch off the side. That's root weevil damage. You're not going to be able to catch them because they live in the soil, crawl up at night, do their feeding back in before sunrise. But there are some things you can do to, to, to get rid of them. There's a product here in the store called Eight. It's the number eight written out, but it's a granular eight. It's not liquid spray. So if I get granular eight and I sprinkle that out underneath the drip lines of my roadies, it's very cheap. It's only about $12 for a bottle. It'll cover about 1,500 square feet underneath your roadies. That's a lot of roadies in the yard. But it's a simple one to broadcast on the soil and eliminate the, the larva, which means you won't get the adults and you, you'll hopefully win against the, the notches. The one I would worry about more is on the right there. Last three, four, five years, it seems like everybody is getting lace bug. 
you know, that's a really tough one uh, to eradicate. Once you've seen the damage, like on that leaf there, the damage is done. If I turn that leaf over, I'm going to see black kind of little tar spots all over the foliage. That lets me know that they've been on there feeding away, um, leaving me presents, as we say. Um, you know, there's a couple different ways to attack lace bug. Neem oil is certainly a viable option if you want to stay organic. That's something we can spray on the foliage. We have to make sure, though, that we get under and over. So, I mean, it's kind of easy to do on some roadies, maybe not the easiest on others. You've got to get the whole thing covered, not just spray the top and walk away. It's got to cover the leaves. If we get neem oil on there, then we can choke off oxygen and we will get the larva off the plant. Um, the other option is spinosad or spinosad, some people call it. Um, that's been a number of different natural insecticides here. And again, as they start hatching here and doing their damage in April, May, June, and into the summer, if I can get that spinosad on there probably two or three times, you know, a couple weeks apart, again, you'll get the larva um, off the plant and end up winning. Um, you know, the other option, I, you know, is murder, death, kill, systemic. And, you know, I would never do that when the plants are in bloom. Certainly that's an option if that's your thing. We could spray a systemic on there after flowers and probably have it soak into the foliage. But, um, you know, systemics, again, aren't the best thing for us or, or for the environment. So I'll, I'll leave that up to, up to your choice, uh, which one to make. Um, the hardest thing with lace bug, again, is once the damage is done, I'm sure people are probably asking Steve right now or going to email that looks like mine. What do I do to fix it? You know, I don't have a magic answer except for A, clean up all the leaves as they drop, get them out of the plant, make sure you spray, feed it, absolutely feed it. And to me, one of the more important things is, is once the new growth has come out after it blooms here this spring, get the spray on the new growth. We have to break the cycle and make sure that they don't keep attacking the same leaves. It's the same exact answer with these two. You know, powdery mildew on rhododendron typically shows up on the bottom of the leaf. So if you turn your leaf over and you look at that foliage and you see spotting gray, brown kind of patterns like that, doesn't necessarily show on the top, it's just on the bottom, that's your powdery mildew. If I see brown on the top all the way through the leaf, <coughs> excuse me, then we will typically have more of a fungal leaf spot. Again, Got to get these sprayed. You're going to see all these infected leaves drop as we pass bloom. All the old leaves will drop off. And if we don't spray, you're going to end up with a shell with one set of leaves that just came out and everything else is going to be gone. I see a lot of rhododendrons driving around that have the mildew issue in particular, and there's not much leaves left on them. They bloom great here in spring. It doesn't affect the new growth or the buds. But if we don't spray, the, the cycle just continues year after year. So feed them, perhaps spray with the copper fungicide. Fungenil would be an option. There's a lot of things listed for powdery mildew or, or fungal leaf spots on roadies. But make sure we get them sprayed. And again, same as that bug, make sure the new growth gets protected too. Now, evergreen azaleas, real quick. Um, you know, this is one that we would keep our leaves in the winter. There's no yellow, there's no orange. Those are two things that, that people ask for a lot. There is no yellow or orange evergreen azalea. So pinks, whites, reds, purples, every shade in between, um, but no, no, no yellow or orange. You know, again, like Brody's, I think there's some great ones that we can grow in, in, in almost full sun. There's other ones we wanna do a little bit more shade, um, but certainly picking the right one. The color scheme kind of follows the roadie, whites, Lighter pinks maybe a little better in some afternoon sun protection. Hot reds, purples, a little better in the afternoon sun. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I would always clip my azalea to keep it compact, to keep it heavier flowering. You know, if you've got a woods, woodlandy, woodsy yard, nothing says you have to prune them. Maybe you like the plants a little bit taller and a little bit more uneven. You know, again, it's your yard. It's not mine. You can do, you can do it either way. Um, I would always plant azaleas myself in groups of three, five, whatever, you know, one here and one there, I don't think has quite the impact. You know, they're great border shrubs that don't get tall. So if you can do three here and three there and three here, you can kind of mix up your colors um, and I think have a more impressive landscape. Um, and the one thing I'll mention the last one there, you know, a lot of people call uh, here about double blooming azaleas. They want ones that bloom in spring and fall. 
you know, I'm sorry, but Encore Azaleas is the one everybody asks for. Lowe's carries it. Home Depot carries it. Um, not one of those plants would have lived this winter. They are not already up here, so we choose not to carry them. Uh, we have a few in a newer series called Double Shot. I think we only have lavender and watermelon right now. We'll have grape and a pink one in a little later. Um, that's a hardier one. We've increased our hardiness by 10 to 20 degrees. I'm much more comfortable with saying, yes, you'll get nice spring bloom. You would rebloom again in that late August, September time frame. So nice to have two, two sets of, of flowers on those azaleas. You know, I look at winter color. You know, again, a lot of mine, like Gerard's fuchsia, Johanna, there's a lot of great evergreen azaleas that will turn purple, a different color in the winter, and then back to green come spring. So again, add another season of interest. All of them have nice spring flower, but look for a foliage you like as well. Something variegated. You know, we carry a beautiful one uh, called Silver Sword <clears throat> or Gerard's Variegated Gem. Those will have beautiful silver white on green leaves all year and look nice, plus a great flower here like all of them in spring. You know, Gumpo Azaleas are great dwarf ones. I only want an azalea that's going to grow a foot tall, a couple feet wide, and stay in a nice low, tight mound. That's an option for a lot of folks that want something dwarf. We have Gumpo White, Gumpo Pink, uh, Gumpo Fancies, kind of got both colors mixed in. Uh, I love the Kimono series of Azalea. That's one of the newer ones. Uh, I've got a couple in my yard now, but ones like Maraschino, Shanzanetta. You'll see a few here at the nursery. We've got a pretty good selection of them. Uh, May Snow just came in. That's a great white one. Um, those are great, compact, really heavy bloomers. I mean, I want to stay under two feet. I like some color in the winter on the foliage, but I want a nice low tight one, really heavy flowering. I think those kimonos are, are excellent. Um, and the last one there's Satsuki azaleas. You know, again, borrowing some plants from Japan like we usually do in our yards. Uh, satsuki is a, some flavors, lots of options there that bloom really late. So Satsuki azaleas would be later May into June. They've got large flowers typically and a lot of variation. So one plant might have salmon, white, pink, all together on one plant. Uh, some flowers will come out quartered. You know, if I had one, one flower, white in the corner, pink here, striped here. You know, very interesting, kind of unique azaleas if you like something fun. But the point is with azaleas, I mean, I could probably walk out the door here, look left, look right. I could probably see 25 different kinds of azaleas here in bloom at the nursery right now. Um, here's a couple pictures, <clears throat> you know, there's my, you know, presents from my yard there. You can see that in full bloom behind some nice purple hookera because I love hookeras. Um, but Hino Crimson there would be a great red one. And you can see again, because I'd lightly shear those, it only takes a few minutes every spring. Look at the amount of flower on there. I mean, those plants are 15 years old. They're about a foot and a half tall, three feet across. And I can't see the leaves when they're in flower. Peggy Ann, we just got some more of those in. If you like the two-tone flower, that's a really pretty white with that pink edge going on it. Uh, there's my Gerard's fuchsia from the other corner of my front yard. So that would give me that fuchsia purple color a little bit taller, which is what I wanted in that spot in the garden. But certainly, again, look at the amount of flowers on there compared to foliage. You can hardly see a leaf because they're blooming so heavy because they get lightly pruned. If we like lavender, that's a great little double lavender one called Elsie Lee. We have a few of those. There's a double shot watermelon. There's one option where you can kind of see great azalea flower, but again, something I will have spring bloom and then rebloom again late summer into fall. Silver sword. <clears throat> There's the variegated one we talked about. So pretty flower, but if you look at that foliage, that's going to look interesting all season instead of just more green. And there's a couple of the kimonos. There's Shanzanetta and Maraschino. Again, really nice, tight uh, growth habits. A smaller grower, heavy flowering, and I think really easy to grow. And some gumpos. You know, again, you can see the short, compact stature. Maybe a little bigger flower on each one, uh, but very, very attractive. <clears throat> and there it kind of explains the satsuki. So if you look at that, that getsutoko there, you can see every flower is a little different. Some are solid white, some are kind of salmon, some have stripes in them, some are kind of quartered. Very interesting way to go. And then another one will be Hygasa. We'll have these in here pretty quick. 
And that is a huge flower. That's probably the biggest flower I've ever seen in an azalea. Um, big, huge orchid pink bloom on, on that satsuki. Now, just a couple things to watch for on azaleas. Um, you know, leaf gall is one. If you have it, you probably go, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. Um, it's not the end of the world. It's not the plague. Don't go throw your plant in the garbage. Um, lightly prune the galls off. If you prune after bloom, this will take care of that without having to worry. And then perhaps get a, a one spray of a copper fungicide on it. Um, some of azaleas are probably a little more prone to leaf gall. Rosebud always comes to mind if you like the little double pink one. Um, I have one called Coral Bells in my yard that I've had it maybe once or twice in 20 years. Um, the, the point is just don't let it sit. If you let it sit, you're going to have those funky little white galls that look very strange on pretty much all the tips of the branches. If we prune it real quick, spray it, you'll probably never see it again. Very easy one to take care of. Then on the right there is root rot. You know, we have wet winters. I don't need to kind of newsflash anybody who lives up here. Um, and we have to be careful on drainage. Again, we talked about all roadies, all azaleas, very shallow rooted. They're not super deep. But if I plant an azalea, you know, eight inches above hard pan clay, I'm going to probably have root rot in a few years because the water's got nowhere to go in the winter. We can't have standing water on the root system. Perhaps we have a plant coming out of winter that the leaves are hanging down like that. That could be a roadie, azalea, anything we're talking about today. Um, I don't have a cure for that. If you've got root rot, that plant has got to go in the garbage. We can't save it. And we would probably not plant roadie azalea there unless we amend the soil, break that clay out of there, um, and fix our drainage problem. Uh, lace bug, same exact discussion as the roadie. You know, that's a great underside picture where you can see the larva, uh, some of their frass, we call it, which is just a fancy word for insect poop, sorry. But uh, you'll see the frass on the bottom there. You know, that's why we have to get up underneath those plants when we spray. I think it's easy to do sometimes on a, on a roadie, a little bit harder to get amongst all the branching of azalea and try to get it treated, but do your best because you definitely want to get the lace bugs out of there. Um, and once in a while, I put white flies on there. You know, white flies kind of like anything fresh and green, you know, as we head into spring. Um, so just walk by, you know, if you, you kind of take your hand and lightly brush the new growth, on a roadie, on an azalea, on any plant for that matter, you're going to see the little white, you know, kind of fly off and then re-land somewhere. So that's a note. Okay, I usually grab my water nozzle and kind of drown them and rinse them into the soil. But there's a lot of easy uh, sprays to take care of white fly as well. Now, last one here, deciduous azaleas. Um, you know, this is our plant that'll lose its leaves. And I, I think a lot of people think, well, I don't want anything that loses its leaves. I just want evergreen. It doesn't have to all be evergreen in your yard. There's some great deciduous plants too. And no different with azalea. There's some really pretty uh, deciduous, Exbury, Knapp Hill. We can go on and on. There's a lot of classifications of deciduous azalea, but stunning in bloom. They got great fall color. <clears throat> I'll tell you right now, if you're like me and you like orange and yellow, that's where you're gonna get it in an azalea, especially the orange. There's nothing else out here in roadie evergreen azalea land that's ever gonna be true orange except for deciduous azalea. So that's a really popular choice uh, in April or May here when they bloom. If you like orange, come get them because we always sell out. We got a whole bunch right now, um, but that's a, the way you're gonna get that pumpkin orange flower in the yard. A lot of the deciduous azaleas have great smell. You know, who doesn't like fragrance in their yard? I think everybody does. So if we've got a nice fragrance added to that color, great. We've got some fragrant options. There's a lot of deciduous azaleas, not quite as many as our 5,000 roadies, but there's a lot of them. You know, we try to get a nice mix of colors. You know, we've got quite a few here, um, but certainly a lot of options out there for you as a gardener. <clears throat> you know, this is a plant, you know, that I would put in the background. This isn't a plant I plant right by my front door you know, right in the edge of the bed. We want to go back one level, let that shrub get some size to it and have something out in front of it. That's a great way to design with deciduous azaleas. You get to enjoy the flower. They're a little bit top heavy so we can see the foliage, but we've got something attractive on the front that's evergreen, maybe to hide the base of it a little bit so we can have that wood just pop over that first layer of the yard and really show us our flowers come springtime. 
So prune after bloom again, no different than the, the rhododendron is, uh, evergreen azaleas. We prune them after they flower if we want to keep them down a little bit uh, in size. We just prune that one time, never fall, never summer, or we're going to cut off our flower buds uh, for the next season again. Um, and uh, for me, you know, some people will probably differ, right? I, I see them growing anywhere, morning sun, afternoon shade. Um, you know, the main issue with deciduous azaleas and too much shade is going to be a little mildew, which we'll see here in a minute, a picture. Um, I give them as much sun as you can. You know, I've got a great orange one in front of my house called Arneson's Jam. That's a, a great old orange one. Never had to fight anything on it. And I am all day cooking facing south afternoon sun. It just has not needed any maintenance. If I had that same thing and mostly shade, I would probably have to fight uh, mildew a little bit on it. So... So uh, remember, the more sun, the better um, on a lot of the deciduous azaleas. Now, here's a few to kind of show you. Um, you know, this light series uh, came, came out of University of Minnesota, you know, decades ago. And there keeps being some more colors kind of come out, which are fun. Um, you can tell when I said the word Minnesota. So we're talking something hardy down there in the 20, 30 below zero range. So a great option for colder climates. Um, and again, I can get all the real bright colors I want. We've got electric lights red. We've got mandarin, gets me a beautiful orange flower. Uh, we've got pinks out there. Um, that's a great series. You know, maybe something that grows three or four feet tall and it's nice and bushy. <coughs> it turns pretty color in the fall, gets a really nice spring flower. Um, and it's a little more manageable in size. You know, there's a picture of my Arneson's jam in front of my house right there, the yellow with the orange mixture. Um, I'm really low on these. We'll have a bunch more coming in Monday, I hate to say. It'll be after the weekend. Uh, we got delayed this week with the shipment, but we'll have some more next week. Um, that's a great orange option. Arneson's golden solitaire. We'll have more of those as well, a yellow. You know, Arneson is an old breeder uh, that passed away years ago down from Willamette Valley in Oregon. So he not only got great flowers, but I think some of his varieties are a little better foliage, a little more disease resistant um, as far as the mildew end of it. You know, Weston azaleas <clears throat> are really late bloomers. You know, these look like honeysuckle and frankly, they smell like honeysuckle. If you like fragrance, uh, Weston azaleas are fabulous. We've got a couple in now, we'll get more of these because these are blooming more like mid-May through June, sometimes even in early July. This is a much later bloomer, um, but great smell. And again, all the different colors. I put a couple on here. Lemon drops, a good yellow. Popsicles, a good pink. But we would have an orange. We would have a red. We would have a white. Um, we've got some options on those. And then probably the two best sellers around here, and it's been that way as long as I've been here, and it was that way at the other nursery I ran before that, Gibraltar and Klondike. You like orange, come get a Gibraltar. You will not lose with Gibraltar. Uh, if you like pumpkin orange, if you want absolutely bright gold, yellow, Klondike's the way to go. You know, that's the two that we get more uh, select, more, more numbers in than any other variety of deciduous azaleas. A couple fragrant ones <clears throat> that are a little bit more old fashioned. Irene Coster is a variety of our Western azalea or Western rhododendron because all azaleas are still rhododendrons. Um, Irene Coster is one that would give me that beautiful flower, light pink, little touch of yellow, but have a nice fragrance as well. Uh, Mount St. Helens, uh, you can tell is another local one here from Western Washington, but that's got a salmony color. And again, a really pleasing light fragrance as well. We, we've got some of those in. Now, if we look at probably the couple things I see you folks coming down here later in May, June, July to ask what's going on with my azalea. Um, these are probably the two things that I see most commonly up here. The powdery mildew, um, you know, powdery mildew gets on just about any plant period, but it does get on uh, expiry azaleas or deciduous azaleas a little bit. Um, it's not the plague. We don't have to throw our plant away. The leaves will be a little mildewy for the year. Um, but again, it can be sprayed for. And again, the more sun air circulation you have, you're going to be better with mildew. If you cram one of these in the shade or tuck, tuck it in the garden and it's surrounded by other plants, you're probably going to fight mildew a little bit more. If we get it some nice air and a nice open spot to grow, I don't think you're going to have to worry about it quite as much. Uh, the one on the right there 
again, probably the last three, four, five years, more and more people got azalea sawfly, and they love Xperia azaleas. They've been up in our neck of the woods here the last couple springs. You know, if you walked out and you saw your your deciduous azalea looking great, and you walked out a week later and said, what happened? The leaves are gone. You can see that plant picture there. They'll eat all that fleshy green and leave you with the midrib of the leaf. No, it didn't kill the plant. Um, yes, it can feed it. It'll refoliate. Um, but that's one I would definitely spray for if you want to keep your plant intact. Um, you know, use something like the spinosad or spinosad. Um, that's a great natural option. We can spray that on there. Yeah, kill the soft fly larva. Then we would not have this, this problem as we head into later spring, or early summer. So there's a crash course again. You can see our uh, internet site there, website. If you want to check out pictures, we got the lists on there. That may help you as well. Um, and certainly email us anytime. You know, I'm here all weekend. We've got a lot of great staff here that can answer some questions for you um, from the class. I bet you we'll have some more questions to do live here in a second, but I will stop sharing. There you go. Now you can look at all the pretty plants behind me. I'll wait because Nicole's probably going to ask me which ones are behind me so I can show them off to everybody. But just a couple quick uh, housekeeping things. So with all the classes we do, you know, locally here for Sunnyside, we appreciate you jumping on uh, kind of as a reward. Uh, hopefully you learned something and will teach you some success. But you come down and do some shopping. The sun is out. You can see it gleaming on my bald head through the greenhouse roof here. Um, it's a beautiful day. I say 60 degrees, like I'm gonna go run to the beach, but it's 60 degrees today, which is uh, exceptional this year. And I thought I saw 67 tomorrow, which means we'll probably put on our sunscreen, right, Nicole? Um, but we've got uh, sales going here for the class. So starting today, it's prime time for Rhodey Azalea. They're all blooming. We've got a great selection, 20% off all Rhodey Azaleas, deciduous Azaleas today through next Friday. The organic roadie food we mentioned, 20% off that as well. We want you to feed your plants. We want you to go, wow, look at all the flowers I got again this year. Keep them fed like we talked about. And you're going to have happy roadies. And then also that pink bag, that special acid planting mix or acid potting soil. We can use it either way. <coughs> That's on 20% off as well. So all three things from the class, we're a great way to start. We get you all set up. Uh, with a little 20% discount on all three. Now, tomorrow, uh, if you're not bored of listening to me, tomorrow I got fine class. We call it Colorful Climber. So I'll be talking about honeysuckles and clematis and wisteria and all kinds of fun, clingy, climby, crawly things tomorrow in our class. Uh, we'll be doing vines at 11 a.m. Um, we do take a few weeks off here. May is crunch time in the nursery business. Mother's Day week is kind of the crescendo uh, to all re retail nursery season. So uh, you won't be seeing me here for a few weeks and we'll be back uh, May 21st. We'll be starting kind of container annual time. And I'll, I'll, be, I'll have some special guests in here playing around with me, but we'll have the fillers, the thrillers and the spillers class, which is a great way to kind of learn container design, uh, how to utilize containers and permanent plants um, and work on hanging baskets as well. So hopefully you'll you'll join us for that that uh, that weekend. So uh, I'll mention again real quick. We've got some special guests here today. I can hear them setting up outside. Uh, the Pilchuck chapter of the Rodeo Society will be here till two today doing a trust show. So if you're a, a roadie lover, a, a half a roadie geek like me, come down here and talk shop. These are fun folks that have been doing this for 30, 40, 50 years breeding their own varieties, bringing some really cool flowers in. Um, and like I mentioned, they've got the plants down here, little gallon sized plants, an unbelievable selection. If you like some really fun, different rhododendrons, come down, take a look at the table. We've got something I'm sure that will catch your eye and you get to help out the Rhodey Society too, because that does help their nonprofit so we can keep the rhododendrons going here for another generation, okay? So let's see if, Mr. Smith got all the questions or do we got any more here, Nicole? Oh, there's always questions. There's always oh, so much that we all need to learn. Awesome. <laughs> well, I, have to show you, I have to show you plants here. Um, I mean, you know, I always love to know all of the varieties. Yeah. You know, it's different in pictures than in actual, you know, plants. So if you can ooh, lift them from yeah, weird positions. I'll show you a couple here. So this is Mr. Honeybutter. And if you can see with the light shining through, I'll kind of turn it two directions. 
I've got orange, I've got peach, and I got yellow. It looks like honey butter. That's a sweet little plant. We just got some more of those in yesterday. What else did I bring in here fun? Let me grab one more I thought would be fun to show. So this is gold prins with a Z. And that's what I'm talking about with modern rhododendron. Look at that yellow flower. And if you can see those kind of paprika red spotting on the lobe, and that's a really pretty flower. And I think a nice foliage. That's a great little kind of more compact yellow. Of course, I destroyed my values on the ground on that one. And let's see if you can see what else do I got back there. Well, you can see the pink up top, the light one that's blooming. That is Bruce Brechtbill. If you like a little pinky yellow color, that's a nice soft one. The Cosmopolitan isn't quite open yet, but that's got a little darker, uh, darker pink. And just because I was trying to hide the light, I got a couple of cool Japanese maples in there too. If you like orange in spring like I do, that's one called First Flame. Those are spectacular with kind of an orange red color. So how's that? There's a couple of that was great. And people even said, oh, I was going to ask what that was. So you nailed it before they even asked. Good. I also like the combination between the maples and the roadies. Nice, good yeah. buddies, partners. Need one, more, need one more big one right behind my head, but then I'd be in the roof. So I, I had to mix that one. <laughs> I like it. Um, so we've got some questions. Um, mm -hmm. So what about... You mentioned the lace leaf fly. Are deciduous azaleas less prone to those um, since they lose their foliage? Or are they still yeah. at the same kind of high risk? Yeah, lace bug is just going to be on our on our evergreen. Rhodia azalea, it's the same issue on both. The deciduous azalea would be the soft fly that likes to take your leaves for the season. Um, but yeah, because we lose our leaves, there's nowhere for a, for a um lace bug to overwinter and keep itself alive for the next season. So you, you won't see those on deciduous azaleas. Good. Great to know. Um, is there any harm in using horticult horticultural oil instead of neem to prevent and do some pest control? No, there's not um, at all. And in fact, um, you know, I've used it before on mine as a preventative. It's, it's the same idea as neem, but I would just say this. Um, I would not be using the oil um, perhaps as much during the growing season on those. I think sometimes you'll magnify the sun on a day like today. Nemo would be safer, you know, in the May, June, July, you know, that kind of time frame. Um, if you're, you know, for me, um, the best way to get a head start on that lace bug, if you've had it, is you want to go out in the fall, the early winter, and get a dose of oil down. And that's a great time to take advantage of the horticultural oil kind of in the dormant season. Okay. Good to know. We've got some suggest or some recommendation requests from you for certain kind of generalized areas. Um, so what about a yellow deciduous azalea that has fragrance? Do you have any suggestions for that? Ooh, that's a tough one for fragrance. I got some great yellows. Let me think. Yeah, we're gonna um, rack your brain with these. <laughs> well, we, we we would probably go the Westons. There's a there's a, a Westons yellow azalea. You know that would be later blooming. Um, you know, the, the, this is going to sound weird, and I wish we could find them because I have one in my yard that I inherited, and I've been trying to get people to kind of take cuttings of it and grow it. But, you know, we saw Irene Coster. You know, it was a pink. It's not the color you're looking for, but that is what you want. The Western azaleas or Occidental azaleas have a huge variation of seed color um, and flower color, for that matter, and those would be fragrant. So that's what I have. It doesn't have a name. It's just some random seed. It was planted 50 years ago in my yard in Everett, and it's unbelievably fragrant. It smells like honeysuckle, you know, for a month here in May when it blooms. So I don't think you're going to find a lot of that in nursery, not to not make you come shop up here. I think what you want to do if you're on the hunt for fragrance, go to the Species Foundation. Go to, you know, the Arboretum plant sale down in Seattle, you know, at Washington Park Arboretum. Um, I have seen some stuff down there. You're not going to find it in a nursery. And if you can find somebody who's willing to give up seedlings of some of these hard, hard to come by ones, um, that would be the way to go. <clears throat> I'm still going to bug our local grower again this year. Will you please come to my house, take some cuttings of this one. It doesn't have a name. You can call it whatever you want. It doesn't have my name on it, but it is what you're asking me for if I can find them. <clears throat> okay. What about uh, deciduous azalea in the salmon color? Salmon. 
in salmon for sure it would be uh, mount saint helens i mean that's the local one um everyone remembers the volcano blue here what 42 years ago here in a couple of weeks i remember it as a little child but um uh, but that that salmon would be that color you want and it does have a nice pleasing fragrance that would be the way to go for salmon okay uh, what about planting, you know, we talked about sun versus shade and kind of how, which ones can handle some things, but what about under like trees? Is there, um, you know, good varieties for under say like cedar trees in wooded yeah. areas? Well, it, any kind of woodlandy garden is a great spot for rhodia azalea. Um, you know, again, we're going to be a little more particular on which ones we choose. Um, and you're probably going to be, if it's deep, dark shade, you're going to be okay with maybe a little bit more open growth habit. They'll bloom great. Nothing will change. Um, but maybe not going to be super dense and compact. Um, I would stick by the original thing at the beginning, kind of to simplify it, is white, yellow, you know, great spot to try some of these orangey, you saw honey butter here, any of that stuff would be ideal, you know, kind of underneath the trees, getting just a couple hours of sun late in the day or morning or that filtered light. Uh, those would all be great choices for that. Okay, excellent. Uh, I think that's it. I mean, we've covered that's a lot it. of ground today as usual. And it's always surprising yeah. when it's like, wait, that's all the questions. Um, but as usual, you know, we're always here. We're open seven days a week, especially it's spring. It's super um, like invigorating that now the sun's out and it feels like let's get outside. Let's just be outside, do some planting. Um, so if you've got questions that pop up as you're out in your yard or just maybe after you walk away, cause that always happens, right? You think of it after it's the second too late. Um, give us an email, give us a call, stop by. It's beautiful, just walk around and kind of enjoy the environment by these beautiful um, blooming plants. And the Rhodey Society, I took a peek. There are some really cool things that they brought with us. So I'm, I'm, going out, I'm going outside to look here in about 30 seconds because I want to see what they brought today. <laughs> and you know if Trevor's getting one, that that means it's a cool, rare species that you got to snag one for yourself. So hopefully we get to see you around the nursery now that the weather's, you know, turning around for us here in the Northwest. Um, and hopefully we'll get to see you tomorrow for climbing vines. Um, so I forgot the name, but it's fine. It's colorful climbing vines. Um, so hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for joining us today and uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah. Thanks everybody for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow and calm down today. It's a beautiful day here. <laughs>